Hello, and welcome back to the Play It Forward podcast presented by Peace Players, the podcast where we lift up voices and stories of people working in their communities and networks to promote peace and equity. So we have these extra grins on today because we're really excited. We're always excited, but today is, is a special day. Uh, my name is Shane Nwagbo, and I am your host. All of you know that by now. I'm hoping you guys have been tuning in for the last two seasons. Season three is just going to get better. Uh, and on today's episode, <laughs> we will be speaking to our very special guest on the road to overcoming grief, standing up to adversity, and seeing people as people. That's one of our core values at Peace Players. So I'm excited about that. But before we get there, but look over your shoulder. Look over your shoulder before we get there. I have to. I must introduce my most amazing co-host, Emmett Shepard. Emmett. Oh, woo. Emmett. Guys, 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 calm down. I'm just a person. I get up, I put the pants on just like you. Um, Chinny, we're back. It I know, right? so good to be back. I know. Um, hello, everybody. I know you missed me. <laughs> I missed you too. Hi, I am Emmett, the incredibly lanky and somewhat funny co-host to the beautifully intelligent and beautifully good looking Chinny Nuagwa. Oh, Chinny. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Appreciate Without it. Without further ado, I, you know what? I, to say I'm excited for who we're talking to today is an understatement. This is like uh, she's been adopted into our family pretty much, <laughs> and she's going to be living a lot closer to my family, which is awesome. always a plus. And I'm excited to see her, you know, grow chickens. Do we grow chickens? I don't think we grow chickens, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go we'll, with it. We'll, we'll, we'll with breed it. We more chickens yeah. and uh, hopefully write another book, question mark. But we'll get all into that. Chinny, please let the people know. Absolutely. Absolutely. It'd be my it'd be my honor. Our guest today is a New York City EMT that has worked as a first responder during the COVID-19, which you can read more about in her memoir, The First Responder, a, rem a memoir of life love death on new york city's front lines named one of time's best books of april 2021 if you haven't read that yet go grab one that's all i'm gonna say not mm -hmm. only is she published a published author with her own book and several featured articles in the new york times salon and forbes she also had a show because so i want to hear about this show in 2017 mm -hmm. a co-women show with felice bell was featured on ted talks i love ted talks she is also a crisis manager licensed private investigator the list goes on and on and on. We also share the same um, modern. If you're not standing up right now for Syracuse, <laughs> go Cues. I am excited, as you can hear and see and hit and probably just like feel through your bones mm -hmm. to bring on this amazing guest. Please help me welcome Jennifer Murphy. Jennifer, Jennifer. welcome to the show. Thank you. What an introduction. Thank you. Yeah, that's actually it. We're all good now. And I think uh, <laughs> we have no more time left in the episode, but uh, I'm done. I've gotten what I need. <laughs> right, right. And I've also used Jennifer, the word excited 50 billion times. So it's, 50 it's fine. Billion. Yeah. yeah. Jennifer, you played volleyball at Syracuse, correct? I did. I did. I, um, I grew up in Bakersfield, California, which okay. is in central California. It's kind of not the California of Hollywood or the Golden Gate Bridge. It is, it is oil and ag, oil and ag town, hot, 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 113 yeah. in the summer. And volleyball is a big, big sport in all hot climate states, Texas, Florida, California. I played indoor. So I played volleyball in high school and, and then I was heavily recruited and ended Ooh. up going to Syracuse, which does not have an amazing, Syracuse is known for football and basketball. And to a lesser <laughs> extent, uh, lacrosse and the women's yes. field hockey team is also quite accomplished. Volleyball, not so much. It's getting but there. I decided to go there because I ultimately wanted to land on the East Coast in New York City. So I felt nice. like it was a stepping nice. stone to just moving out of California. <laughs> and as an athlete, um, I was a star player in high school. And Ooh. I knew if I went to like a Pac-10 school, I would ride the bench for three years before I saw the court. And at Syracuse, I played every, every game of every season yeah. for all four years. I was I'm in their Hall of Fame. Just in case oh. you didn't, you were wondering. Just in case you were wondering, we were yeah, talking to a Hall I know, of Famer. It's my past life. I was like a, I was a big volleyball player. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Oh my God, Hall of Famer. Well, before I want to, you know, it sounds like you're very strategic in your moves, uh, life wise, career wise. We're going to explore on that later. But before we do that, um, Jennifer, there's this thing. I don't know if you've heard it. It's been in the papers a few times. I know that uh, local government officials talk about it all the time, <laughs> word of mouth. Uh, 
it's it's sort of throughout uh, all of America. It's really, been told it for generations really that I am yeah. the icebreaker king. king. And I, yes. I don't give myself this it's title. Not him. This, was, it's this not him. was something that was just come to fruition <laughs> on my own. Um, and so today's icebreaker for season three is what's the best piece of advice you, you specifically, have ever been given? And that's how we're going to start. Oh, wow. Exactly. One podcast person asked me like whether I preferred chicken <laughs> wings or chicken legs. And that took me a yeah. moment. Yeah. That is important. That is important. That is important. It is actually quite important. What is the most important um, advice I've ever been given? Um, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, to thine own self be true Ooh. and um, live a life of love and service. Mm. 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 You get slam you poetry noises all the way for that. In. Mm. Yeah, you lean all the way into that. I also slam poet. That's how I know fully self from the Poets Cafe. There you go. There you go. Beautiful. Uh, Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that's oh, you, you know what? I'm gonna jump right into it because I mean, also you're a slam, slam poet. Okay. So my question for you, Jennifer, is obviously there's no question that you've been involved in probably the most decorated careers and professions across the board. Um, and, and without assuming anything at all, I'm interested in understanding first, uh, were the variety of careers you 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 had, were the, was that strategic? Was it planned? Or was it something that just kind of fell into your lap per se? Like you have done so many amazing things. You've been EMT, you've been a writer, private investigator, uh, crisis manager, a hall of famer, a slam poet, you know, I mean, it, the list goes on and on. And since we talked about sports, sports earlier, I'm, I'm wondering how does sports kind of play a role in all of that? So I'm, I'm, I'm open yeah. to listening here. I mean, starting to kind of reverse engineer the question from the back, I think sports saved my life as a young person. Mm. Athletics really, um, you know, I had a, my family, my parents divorced when I was a teenager mm. and it was a, around the time I'm old, I'm 46. And so this was like, you know, the, the yeah, early nineties, not many of my friends had parents who were divorced. It was, mm. it was still kind of taboo and it was heartbreaking and athletics gave me a place to kind of put all of that inner turmoil, um, to put my rage. I mean, volleyball, you're literally just jumping around, slamming a ball to the floor as hard as you can. And you're <laughs> for it. That's the game. Um, people always ask because I'm six foot one. I, I fear that I'm actually six foot two, but I, I stand behind six foot one. Um, but people often ask if I played basketball, but I hate being pushed around. Like basketball involves a lot of shoving. <laughs> right. that, that's my shoving, sport. Right. That's I'm like, sport. don't shove me. Don't chase me. I don't enjoy it. It's not fun. I like to stand in place, minimal movement, no running and hit something very, very hard. Um, right. So I think as a young person growing up in California, it really was an amazing outlet for a lot of emotions that I just could, I was just too young to process. And right. it also gave me an immediate community, uh, a second family. Absolutely. And it's a, you know, it's, it, as a team sport, I, I had all of these, I'm a, I have one brother and we're not terribly close. He's five years older than I am. So he was kind of out of the house by the time I was in high school, but volleyball, suddenly I had all of these girlfriends who felt like sisters mm. and that continued throughout college. I'm still close with many of the women I played volleyball with at Syracuse. And we, we try to see each other every few years, even though we're all over the country. So I really think athletics gave me a foundation to, move through the world in a kind of fearless way yes. um, and not be afraid to support other women, right. to learn how to compete, but not necessarily with other women. Um, you know, the field of writing is oftentimes, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a life of rejection and failure for every one mm -hmm. thing that hits, you're going to get some like 30 things rejected. Right. And the important thing is to be in the game. And I think, athletics taught me to celebrate when other people have victories because it Absolutely. shows you that you too can have that victory so I'm never the writer who's sad when my friends are like getting an award or getting right. a movie deal or getting a like oh that didn't happen for me other things have happened for me and if it can happen to them it can happen for me mm -hmm. too yeah. um 
So I think athletics, it, it played a, a phenomenal role in, in my life, even though I'm not, you know, currently playing volleyball, I'm still pretty physically active mm. and that's a great stress reducer as well. Yeah. And career wise, I have, my strategy was really one of fear and failure, <laughs> even though listening to you, I'm like, I don't need to do anything else today. I'm just a great person <laughs> right. and I can just throw this You're phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. 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 I was yeah. eating cookies for breakfast that I made. Like, great life. But the truth is I studied journalism at Syracuse and English and text, textual studies. And then I did a master's degree at the University of Chicago in the humanities. And nice, really nice. what I wanted to do was study creative writing. It's the only thing I wanted to do since I was a girl. And mm. I didn't do it because I was scared. Wow. I didn't study it because I also come from an Irish family that's very, you know, be a doctor, lawyer, get a degree that will result in money. Right. And arts were discouraged, strongly, strongly discouraged to study the arts. So even though I was on a full scholarship, it wasn't like my parents were paying for me to go to Syracuse or the University of Chicago. Right. Um, I felt obligated to study things that maybe would result in uh, financial, like generating wealth. Yeah. yeah. And ironically, not until I moved to New York City in 1998, after my schooling, did I find the New York and Poets Cafe. And that space became another home. It gave me my best friend Felice who's a, a co um, co-writer on a show we did several years ago and a, a beautiful playwright and poet who has a book coming out next year and extremely diverse community lower east side New York City mm -hmm. um, and really my jobs have been about private investigations and crisis management are a storytelling job Got at it. the end of the day I'm doing, I'm in the private sector. I'm not federal. I'm not law enforcement. So I don't carry a gun. I don't do, wear leather pants. I don't do anything that's really <laughs> like I'm sitting at a desk. I'm a researcher and an, an analyst. And, and at the end of the day, the question is always <laughs> what happened? Like, what is the story? Mm -hmm. My job is to find out what the story is, who's involved, what are their backgrounds, what happened and how can we solve whatever problems have emerged and in that way, some of my storytelling desire is fulfilled and it pays right. the rent. But again, it's as a result of, I've written three novels. Um, Very nice. Starting in my 20s, I, wrote, I started writing novels after I had a collection of poems come out and none of them got picked up by an agent. None of them got published. So I was like, I have to figure out a way to support myself while I write. Right. And you know, ultimately I established my own consultancy because it gave me more freedom to write. And then mm. ironically, after all of these years of kind of writing novels and getting an MFA in fiction at the age of like 38, I published a memoir of all things. And I'm nice. like, oh, mm. life right. is very strange. So I think the strategy, <clears throat> the only strategy I've had is again, to thine own self be true, which for right. me means do what you love, no matter what, if you don't exactly. get a penny, if you get published, if you go, go big, but if I can always return to writing, I'm a happy woman. Mm. That was an excellent, excellent answer. I'm sorry. I just, Jen, it's, it's curious to me because, um, a lot of what you've done, it's like a disparate of interests in a lot of ways. Like some of it seems very collaborative and others seem like immense amounts of solitude that uh you have to go through and sort of uh you know like you said you're like volleyball is a team sport you have to have a team sort of mentality but at the end of the day it's very individualistic at the same time you're doing it by yourself it's it's all on you to hit the ball kind of thing um and you know emt work is also very collaborative at the same time but at the same time it can be very isolating and feel very much like you're on an island by yourself and i'm sort of curious just like do you think, like, how do you understand the ways in which all those interests and stuff that you do is connected? And if it is connected in your mind or if it isn't connected in your mind? I think it is connected to me um, in the sense that, as you mentioned, writing is a deeply solitary act. Um, yeah. So you spend a lot of time. To, and I love being alone. 
I, a yeah. lot of people who are extroverts have had that are my friends, our friend Ralph, um, who teaches yeah, at Brown, yeah, yeah. had it had a, like a really struggle during the pandemic because they're extroverts and they need people to feel right. energy. Yeah. I'm the op- opposite. I feel energy when I'm home, mm-hmm. um, when I'm writing, when I'm alone, but I need community. I need connection Mm. and I need to feel like I'm part of something greater than myself. Um, Right. Absolutely. And the EMT world is really, uh, you're alone with your partner most of the time. So your partner is like a second you, you're there, you're there, you're (laughs) everything. Your life depends on your partner. You're two people in an ambulance in New York city and you're with them nonstop and you trust them with your life. And I need that too. I need to feel like, other people need me mm. and absolutely I'm needed, yeah. and that, that I'm giving something purpose. to the community that maybe is undervalued. I rode for free, so unpaid, but makes me feel really good at the end of the day in a way that not to say that writing doesn't, I have a nice sleep if I have a good day at my desk, but it's a very different feeling if I spend a tour on the ambulance, just not thinking about myself and my dreams at all, just thinking right. of other people. Right. Right. You know? right, 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 right. Can I really say something really quickly? Yeah, I would yeah. say writing is, and you you all are the experts in terms of writing, <clears throat> even though I write on my own. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but it, it is a, a thing that you do alone, but if you share it, it reaches so many people. Um, and so I will say that there is that connection there, but Emmett, back to you. That's all oh, I no, no, no. I, I think, th- no, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I've, I've grown up sort of seeing the, the solitude and uh, inclusion or reclusion, so to speak of having writer's parents and also Lucy who has crippling social anxiety. Shouts out Lucy. Um, <laughs> and, who I love. Yeah. yeah. But I think who I love too, you, I hammer, better, you but... hammer home on a very uh, like uh, strong ethos of what we're doing at peace players of just like purpose driven work. Like yeah. I think, yeah. Everybody who works at Peace Players has like immense energy and uh, passion for what they do because of the fact that they're doing something much larger than themselves. Exactly. Um, and so like, you know, I, I to just sort of segue into that a little bit, what was the, you know, I've read your book, sadly. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> what? I'm curious to hear what you thought was the most rewarding of that purpose-driven work for you in, in your own sort of experience. And then also what was the most obviously challenging, but I can imagine there are a long laundry list of challenges. Yeah. That's a good yeah, the, the, EMT, good the, the world of emergency services and, and frontline work is a, is a traumatic, challenging, yeah. dark, yeah. nasty, hilarious world. Um, yeah. It is a kind of world within itself. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. But I think that it was a real gift to be able to, I think I was an EMT for three or four years before COVID started. And, um, and I always loved it. I would ride a couple times a week with my favorite people. And we, we would always have fun, even though we were kind of helping and it was terrifying and sad and all that stuff. But it was, it was also fun. It was fun to kind of drive lights inside. It's, a, it's fun. Yeah. People don't really talk about that enough, I think, because it's portrayed as this kind of like traumatic, like lights and sirens, serious world. Saving it's lives. Serious yeah. Yeah. And it's full of a lot of kind of slapstick mm-hmm. comedy. Um, so it was fun. And then when COVID hit, I think uh, one of the highlights was just being able to, I was like, oh, I'm an EMT. I'm trained. I have I have years of experience, even though mm-hmm you know, in any field under five years is nothing. It's not really, it's you're a rookie until you've got like 10 to 20 years. But but I felt so useful that I could put on my uniform and help when COVID hit. And the city was just sirens and it was dead silent otherwise. And everybody was at home and there were no vaccines. And it was, you know, it was a mass casualty incident. And we didn't know if we were going to get sick or our families or friends were going to get sick. And to be able to walk through that was probably one of the greatest gifts of my life. Mm. Um, I became an EMT in part because I lost a firefighter friend in 9-11 oh. and it took mm. me a long time to kind of walk through that grief and ultimately decide to put on a uniform myself in honor of him. Mm. And I felt like he would be so proud of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and his brother, I was very close with as well, who was dying of World Trade Center related can- cancer while COVID hit 
and I was good friends with him. And so it was a very, you know, 2019, 2020, 2021 were intense, sad, dark yeah. times, yeah. but I felt very, very capable and very Perfect. useful Perfect. in a way that I didn't when I was in my 20s and 9-11 hit and I was kind of just like frozen in grief and trauma. I lived in the disaster zone. It was awful, but I didn't feel like I was at the point where I could contribute to the cleanup or go help first responders or do anything. So this time around to be able to show up and put on my boots and, and walk through the fear and walk through, it was so amazing. And then, you know, interestingly life kind of, I don't want to say life rewards you for doing difficult things, but I did get my book out of that experience. Right, right. You know, yeah. it's, it's not <laughs> hold it up. And I forget, I, I forget I wrote it, but, but as you guys have mentioned, it is about sharing your story and sharing your story can be a way of helping people. And Everyone. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. it's nice that I was on Ted. It's <clears throat> nice that I got right up in the New York times. It's, it's nice that the book is doing well, but the, the most touching moments for me two days ago, I was going to bed and I had an email come in from an emergency room nurse that had just finished the book and said she was in tears and it really helped her process some of the grief of losing her father right, or her right. grandfather during COVID and not mm. being able to be there because she was working. And I've mm, gotten right. letters from cops yeah. and firefighters. And that's what, for me, I'm like, oh, that's a, that feels so good. Yeah. Right. 100%. Yeah. I think no. I, uh, I, I want to say something really quickly, um, but I think, that's the part like when and that's what I was talking about earlier you guys are talking about solitude but that solitude that writing connects you to the world yeah. uh, and it provides a space for people to really resonate like you know with the stories and the words behind that the motions behind those those words that you're writing down but yes congratulations on that amazing book and I want to add this before we get into this really really fun part um I, I've heard you speak uh and it sounds like uh throughout your entire story there is this it's woven in the sense that you you want to be this person that does good. You want to be this person that uses their life in a way to lean into your purpose, to serve others. Um, you you <clears throat> went into EMT because of a, a friend that you've lost. I mean, you are serving, you're, you're serving the world, really. And I want to know how being a woman doing that changes things or how being a woman in this hope to serve the world, in this hope to give what you've been placed on earth to give, how does that affect anything that you're doing, if it does affect anything at all? Mm, I think it does. I mean, uh, what do I wanna say? I mean, the private investigations world the is very male dominated. The mm. security world in general, is a, it's, a, it's a man's world. It's not even a man's world. It's like the man's bathroom. It's <laughs> really, it's yeah. really like 19, 80 frat boy like me um so that's always interesting they're hilarious and hilarious. and um and the emt world the world of first response in in new york city policing is very diverse um across the board gender and race and sexuality but firefighting is largely male 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 and so you're mm -hmm. on scene a lot of times with like you know bob the macho firefighter and um <laughs> You go to a firehouse, like I go every year to my friend's firehouse on 9-11. I think there's maybe one woman I've seen work there um, to the last like decade. Really? Uh, it's, it's all men. You're walking into an all male space and the ambulance, there's a lot of women on, in the street in New York City. And I think one of my motivations for writing the book um, and pitching the book when my agent was trying to sell it to publishers was we never get to hear about female rescuers. Perfect. We never get to yep. see women in uniform who aren't just like sexualized or kind of sidekicks that are having a romance with their partner. We mm. never get to see the kind of sisterhood that happens on scene when you have women rescuing right. men, women, children. And I still think that is a, is missing in the culture. It's, it, we don't see it much. Um, usually there are a couple of big EMS books coming out um, in the near term. Uh, there's a, a long-term fire, 
firefighter paramedic who's the head of one of the unions who has a book coming out in June and Kevin Hazard has who wrote um, A Thousand Naked Strangers which is a very good EMS EMS book has a book coming out about Freedom House which were the first black the the first paramedics in the country who were black Ooh, and so nice. he has that book coming out in November which will be big books but again <clears throat> When I was doing comps, selling the book to say like, what will this book be like? Uh, there, I kept looking for where's a woman author covering women rescuers, right. and right. It's, where's the representation? There's not a lot out there. Right. Very cool. Are it's also ready? just I just wanted to say it's also just good to know like the the amount of soul crushing work that writing is to begin with just the fact that you can hear and see tangible evidence that it affected somebody in a positive way just makes all that soul crushing work a little right. bit more worth it you know yeah. and to it be really like does. oh yeah it just really like does. it's it's you know who knows if you're ever going to get the kind of acclaim that like your mother and father have had <laughs> where, <laughs> yeah sure, you know sure, sure. Mean? shout out to Emma's yeah. mother and father <laughs> they're they're doing the good work out there they're getting the deals they're they're telling the stories and um who knows if that kind of success will ever come my way but the goal again is like keep writing and and i think to touch people in some right. way um right. and so i'm always so grateful when people tell me they've read the book and it meant something to them or they cried or they laughed aloud and it's it's a wonderful thing totally totally yeah, Okay, so we'll do an exhale before we do another inhale into a deep conversation. <laughs> and now we're uh, starting the deep conversation. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that yes. was just the surface. Jennifer. That was just this a smidget. What you're getting ready to go into is something we love to call the lightning round. Insert sounds here. Okay. okay. Emmett is our lightning round king, and he will walk <laughs> you through a series of questions, which you will have three to four seconds to answer. No pressure. A lot of pressure. Uh, when you hear the question, just give the very best answer that you can, but it's a light, fun. Super lighthearted. Don't worry, Jennifer. Heavy. We'll judge oh. you heavily. We'll judge you. Yeah, we'll judge you heavily on each yes. answer, so don't worry there you about go. it. There you go. Um, Jennifer, are you ready? Are no. you ready? No, perfect. Okay, perfect. Timer. Jenny, you have the clock. You have the clock? Okay. And pen. All right. Uh, first one, swimming or hiking? Swimming. Ooh. Still water or seltzer water? Still. Flying or driving? Flying. Dry or humid? Humid. Really? Sorry. Sorry. The book version or the, mute, <laughs> or the movie version? Keep your comments oh, to yourself. It's always better. <laughs> What'd you say, book? Book. Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. Bias, but it's fine. Yeah, right. uh, are you a little <laughs> bit country or a little bit rock and roll? A little bit country. <laughs> oh, okay. Nice. A little bit country. A little Who country. wins in a game of volleyball? A taco or a grilled cheese? Ooh. Taco. Taco. Good yeah, answer. Good answer. That's fair. Yeah. Summer or winter Olympics? Summer. Good job. Good job. Art museums or history museums? Art. iPhone or Smart. Android? iPhone. Perfect. Which do you prefer? A horse-sized duck or a hundred duck-sized horses? A hundred duck-sized horses. Ah, yeah. that's a nice, yeah. That's a be beautiful gaggle of horses. <laughs> um, Batman or Iron Man? Batman. Perfect. Okay. Comedy or drama? Dramedy. Ooh, <laughs> way to blend them together. Way to blend them together. We'll allow it. We'll allow it. Because I agree, dramedy as well. Uh, the last thing you taught someone else to do. Um, that's an interesting question. Do dogs count? Yeah, sure. Yes, absolutely. Uh, go to the go to the bathroom on the <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Shout yeah. out potty trained puppies. Yeah, we love yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then finally, one thing you want the listener to remember from today. Um. Story storytelling is important. It can change the world. Very nice. Mic awesome. drop moment. Absolutely. Jennifer, you killed that lighting round. That was the uh, insert the crowd applause now, please. Because yeah. that was incredible. No. So quick, so fast. Like, let's get through this as quickly as we can. Beautiful. Well done. Very, very wonderful. Loved it. Um, I loved it. 
I was going to say, Emmett, put her on a spot and ask her, her one, a favorite line from one of the poems she's written, but we'll do that. Another oh, day. we'll do that at the Ooh. end. We'll do that at the very end. Yes, very end. yes, yes. Um, thank you so much. So that being said, uh, here at Peace Players, and I'm, I'm not sure how much you know about us, but we use this sport uh, to help young people. Specifically, we use the transformative power of this sport to bridge divides in conflicted um, communities around the world. And one of the things that we are really focused on is just seeing the humanity in others. And we mentioned that before, seeing people as people, all that truly means is seeing the humanity in others. Um, uh, and we, we call that um, one of the core values. We have three others, but we have two others, but that being said, uh, you, you, we may not agree on everything is what this core value talks about. We may not agree on everything, but we can at least come to a common ground where we are working with each other to work with, um, to find the commonalities, common ground, commonalities, but to work in peace uh, and to build a more uh, equitable society. So that's a bit about us. There's a lot more to that. But my question is, in your writings on being a first responder, you talk about how you've experienced the lack of being seen as a person. When people see you as you and your peers in uniform, they forget. They, when people see you and your peers in uniform, they forget the humanity in you. They forget to see that you are an actual person. Why do you think that is? And what do you think you can do? And what have you been doing to change people's perceptions on seeing first responders as people? It's a, it's a great, great, great question and an important question. I think the, the uniform is very powerful, whether mm. it's EMS, fire, police, military. It comes with a lot of kind of mythic symbolism. And a lot of that symbolism is toxic. Um, wow. it's, it's, mm. based on, it's based on inhumanity. Oh, you are in a uniform, therefore you don't cry on scene. Or therefore, you're, you keep it together in a difficult situation, or you are stronger than the average person who's in mm. civilian dress. And one of the goals of my book was to show that none of that is true. Um, rescuers that I know are, are some of the more sensitive people. They're, they, a lot of them have a disposition that's not dissimilar to an artist, um, and they want to help people. And then the, you have the other side of the shadow, which is some people go into fields because they feel they've grown up bullied or they've grown up powerless. And so they want a gun or they want a red yeah, suspender. Yeah. So everybody will clap for them on the fire truck. They want to be a hero. And there's a shadow in that trope too, because, you know, in New York city, we had a really bad fire in the Bronx this year. But that aside, that was like the first big fire we've had in, in decades because we have sprinklers now. So a lot of times if I'm talking to firefighters, they suffer from this view of everybody thinks they're just running through burning buildings all the time. And oftentimes they're like looking at a smoking manhole or getting mm. like some something fell off of a scaffolding and mm, mm -hmm. they have to mm. they have to do this kind of mundane construction like work. But then because they're in that uniform, People are like, can I have your picture? Can I clap for you? And yeah. cops have yeah. the opposite. And EMTs are really invisible. People oh, don't okay. People yeah. don't see us really at all. In mm. fact, in uniform in New York City, you're often mistaken for a police officer um, or another kind of first responder. And so part of my goal with the book was to show that we are just people just like everyone else. And this is the job. And the job comes with lots of emotions. Like after a bad call, you will see first responders break down. Often anything bad happening to a child, you're going to see people in uniform have emotions. Mm -hmm. um, it's nothing about the uniform makes you stronger than anyone else, contrary to popular belief. And so I think, you know, the goal was to have, um, people reading the book see that we're just everyday people right. you know we're just yeah. everyday people and in an ideal world which rarely happens we're seeing we're seeing people that we're helping as just everyday people and not coming to scene with like judgments about whatever predicament right. they're in for instance if someone's overdosing my job is not to give them a lecture about how they shouldn't be shooting heroin in front of their child right. my job right. is to like right. give them narcotics can and resuscitate them and take them Save to the them. hospital and talk about drug addiction and, and rehab right, right. Um, it's not to come Chastise. on scene on some moral high ground you know right 
Right. What one of the things you talk about in the book is sort of the well, at least what I picked up from reading the book was the there's a clear like <clears throat> like your day could be completely mundane, nothing goes on, and you could have also a day where there's like three separate calls that happen that mm-hmm. are starkly different. And I think you talk about the either biker being hit by the car and uh, you freezing and then you feeling sort of the like internal conflict that starts to brew about being like, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm supposed to do, but why did I freeze in that moment? And then the next call happens and you can't even like think about uh, the previous situation because you already are thrown into a new situation kind of like that. And I imagine those things start to feel exhausting and like uh, they start to build up in a sense. And with COVID, especially there was this sense of just the, you know, enduring of just like having to like this, this was never going, this wasn't going away for first responders, Mm -hmm. especially I imagine. And so, you know, when we think about grief and sort of handling immense grief and failure, self failure and stuff like that, when it, when it, when COVID is the backdrop of that, and it seems like it's never ending for a first responder. And on top of that, people are viewing you as sort of these indispensable, just like tools rather than people and just like throwing you into this fire to try to like get the fire to be extinguished. How do you sort of handle both the internal like exhaustion and the external exhaustion of that? I mean, like writing obviously seems to be like one Avenue, but there's gotta be others as well. Yeah. yeah, writing is a big avenue. It, it really helped me get through 2020. Um, and I got a dog. Like, I do feel like the puppy <laughs> is kind of like the puppy has changed yeah. the way my day is organized in terms of I can't just sit home all day and right. be sad. I have to take the dog for a walk. He requires yeah. a lot of energy. He has to go for a run. Like, I need to give him play dates. There's, he has to be fed at certain times. And So there's a kind of inbuilt structure of taking care of something that's not critically sick or dying. That's a young puppy. That's very kind of spiritually uplifting. But I also, and this is not talked about much um, on the street either, but um, burnout is a very real thing for first responders. The average career of a, of a New York city EMT is around five years. And then everybody is done. It's after five years, you've seen enough and you felt enough to just be like, you know what, that's the novelty is gone. The adrenaline doesn't get me there anymore. The the hard part about adrenaline, whether you're talking about athletics or being on stage or publishing or being on an ambulance is it always drops. Mm -hmm. And the more you get, the more you need, it's a bit of a drug in that sense. And um, which is where we get the phrase adrenaline junkie. So I think I stepped off the ambulance last late last fall after September, the book came out in April, a year uh, out of COVID. So, well, into COVID, um, April, 2021. And then I, I was working with some 9-11 first responders who are having a hard time getting health coverage, doing an article for Mm, them that that landed in September for the 20 year anniversary. My friend passed away in 2020. It was the one year anniversary of his, his death. And I, he wanted to move to New York city and get a puppy together with my friend Ilva. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, he was an ER doctor. So I thought, well, I can keep going. Like I could become a paramedic or keep riding on the ambulance. As you mentioned, COVID is never ending because of the vaccines. COVID has also become um, really an emergency for nursing. Uh, Mm -hmm. for the hospitalized more than it is on the street Mm -hmm. um and I thought I think it's time for a break I think I'm adequately fried and cooked Mm -hmm. and burnt out and part of my self-care as an adult um that's changed since I was young is is to know when you've crossed a line and to dial it back got it which means 2022 has been about let me take care of this dog let me move to an environment that has more nature. Let yeah. me take a break from EMS. I'm still yeah. certified and, and, you know, can ride at any time. If I feel like riding great, if I don't, it's totally fine too. And mm-hmm. same thing with writing. I mean, I wrote the book under duress, under an extreme deadline and, and I'm tired. Got you it. You know, I'm yeah. yeah. tired and I think it's okay to be tired. Of, Part of the pandemic, the exhaustion of it all is just trying to catch up 
with all of the emotions that you felt like sometimes Absolutely. I think, what year is it? Like, I don't even know what time means anymore. Sometimes right, I think right. 2020 was a thousand years ago. And yes. now then other times I think it's just yesterday. Exactly. So I'm doing a lot of just kind of <clears throat> resting, catching up, prayer and meditation, good food, good people. Yes. You yes. Know? Taking care of yourself is what you're yeah. doing. That's what it sounds like. And that often happens with people who are always taking care of everybody else. You need yeah. to recharge. You recharge, need to take care yeah. of yourself. Hence the your love for that for solitude. And I want to ask a really quick question because you talked about uh, EMTs being invisible. And I want to talk about the the parallel between being invisible as an EMT and being an African American person uh, in the United States in the healthcare system and the inequities that live there, right? Uh, yeah. And it, can you see that what just your overall story and how you are really persevering. You are standing in the face of adversity, hint, hint, that was our uh, <laughs> opening. But can you see the parallels between what you're doing and that invisibility between being, being an EMT and the poor uh, service that uh, African people of color are receiving from the healthcare system? I mean, yeah. you have that right behind the scenes space and I have like statistics and stuff but I don't think it's important to read that because I mean it's very obvious but can you see a parallel between that invisibility and people of color when we talk about the healthcare system I know that's a far-fetched question but I just wanted it's to not get... because it's a very it, it's a pragmatic question in the sense that as mentioned EMS is very diverse in New York City so many of my partners were people of color Mm. and women and and with female people people of color and you experience um disparity of race and sex and gender at every level on almost right. every emergency you know uh the the volunteer ambulance crew that i worked for many people work full-time in healthcare. so when i talk about taking this time to catch my breath and rest you know what you mentioned earlier is also true, which is that healthcare workers who are full time in that occupation, that that's their career, they are not taking a break. Exactly. They're exhausted. They are standing there. They are taken for granted. People are removing masks mid flight on planes. They've got right. full ERs. Mm. And I think one of the things that's hard for frontline workers, whether you're an ER doctor or nurse or ICU or an EMT is COVID is the same call again exactly. and again. And exactly. partly people get into the field because they like variety. Mm. And so in the beginning of COVID, we saw it affect everybody racially, but of a certain, like it seemed the, the most sick people were the elderly. Um, and that could be the elderly people in the projects, the elderly people in the shelters, or the elderly people in a $2 million brownstone. But it seemed like the most critically ill people were the elderly. But the reoccurring theme in healthcare is like, if you are disenfranchised, financially like if you are living in poverty if you don't have the same opportunities that white america has in terms of job equity pay equity neighborhood mm -hmm. equity mm -hmm. um your your health will suffer i mean a lot Absolutely. of people call 911 and they call an ambulance for minor things because they don't have a primary care physician because they don't have insurance because they cannot afford it right and so then they, you know, so they go to the ER and I don't blame them. Like, you know, their child has a cough and they don't know what it is. And yeah, I have health insurance so I could go to a clinic, but they don't. Right. And so they're going to call 911. And, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, you do see disparity all over the place. And then oftentimes you go into the hospitals and I think it has gotten better, but, um, you know, within any organization, as you go to the top, it often gets whiter and whiter and <laughs> whiter. Right, 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 so, right. so it's a, I, I always say, I think like athletics, healthcare doesn't discriminate in terms of we're all embodied. And if you have a heart problem, it doesn't matter what race you are. Like if your heart problem is your heart problem. Exactly. And so as an EMT, you're treating, like you are treating the body really. Um, mm -hmm. no matter what kind of skin or sex or gender it comes in. Mm -hmm. I wish we could all approach the world that way, right? So true. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's the impossible task that we're all hopefully striving for, yeah. question mark. <laughs> big, big question mark there. How, how much of like the, because I'm still fascinated by the immense uh, 
like the burnout stuff and sort of do, is there a sense of camaraderie amongst your team in the EMT space of like, if you can sense somebody is either burning out or has had a rough day, is there a clear sense of camaraderie that happens to sort of keep people afloat? Or is it a lot more of just like, I am going through immense stuff myself and I have to just like do whatever tactics I have in my tool belt that keep me afloat before mm -hmm. I can even help uh, some of my teammates or is it just a little bit of give and take there kind of thing? I think it's a little of both. I mean, I've stayed close with two of my partners, um, women, Not none of us are on the ambulance anymore, by the mm -hmm. way. None mm -hmm. of us who work 2020 are on the ambulance anymore and none of my partners. One, I think stopped writing um, and he started traveling a lot. So he just pulled himself off the ambulance. He's probably been an EMT for around seven or eight years. And I think he was, he was kind of getting salty before COVID. So after COVID, he was really <laughs> done. Yeah, he was like, goodbye. So forever. nobody has heard much from him for a while. My other two partners, one um, is a nurse now. So she's in nice. an ER. Mm -hmm. and moved from EMS to nursing. A lot of EMTs, either, you either go to paramedicine or nursing. And, um, and my other partner is getting ready to go to nursing school. So mm -hmm. she's also off the ambulance. EMS is a weird world. And so we, we're all in touch. I see them often. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we check on each other. It's a weird world in the sense of when you're in it, there's nothing like it and you're kind of connected and you want to stay in it and it's its own self-generating energy and when you step away from it it really the longer you're away from it the less sense it makes to go back into it right. because mm. it's just so difficult right. it's, and it's sad especially with covid rolling as you mentioned non-stop it's every other emergency plus covid mm -hmm. So, you know, crime is up in New York City. So you've got more shootings, more stabbings, more muggings, more robberies, and then you have COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and in the summer, everybody is out and about. People get hit by cars constantly. Yeah. So it's, it's a busy world. And I think, you know, I, I do try to stay connected to my partners um, off the ambulance, but not everyone does. Sometimes people kind of stay in that world and that's, they don't really do anything outside of it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for just everything and your entire story today. Um, Thank you so much for having absolutely. me. Absolutely. It's been should we amazing. End with the should we end with the yes. poem line? Yeah, typically we end with like, what would you like to tell young people? But I would love to end with, go ahead, Emmett, would you like to ask a question? No, no, no you ask, you ask. Uh, okay, please share with us um, your favorite line from uh, one of your favorite poems that you've You've or your I've best written. friend oh, wow. or your I best friend poems in years, but I remember one line um, from a poem which went, I don't want any more quiet nights alone and I don't want to be so far from home. Oh. And that being said, oh. <laughs> we are closing the show on that and you will not have any more nights alone or be away from home because here is your home. We would love to have you yeah. as many times as we can. Seriously. So thank you so I enjoyed much. this so much. You guys yes. are the best. Thank you. thank you, Jennifer, thank for you coming so on. Seriously. You. And thank you for all your hard work. And go get first responder. First responders. Yeah. You will not. What's the word? Regret it. Regret you won't regret it. it. Right. You, yeah, won't regret it. it. <laughs> you won't regret it. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Bye. Bye, Thanks, Jennifer. Jennifer. Bye. Take care. Bye. And that's it. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> Sorry for the long pause there. I was uh, like, was did dramatic. I off? What Queen happened? Cut, yeah, yeah, like... cut. It, you, you can tell we haven't done this in a while. We forgot the, yeah. we forgot the, oh my the gosh. system there. Um, I'm forgetting what like, words mean. Me too. I was definitely are. over my words. I was like, uh, basically, <laughs> no, what I'm trying to say great. is. That was so fun. Thank oh you so God. much. Yes, yes. Have thank you. We appreciate you. Yeah, thank you, thank you for energy. doing this. And Whatever you need. I love it. Send me the link yeah. when it's ready. I oh, yeah, you will, you will. Yeah, yeah. You're pretty we funny. You like have really will. good dry humor. <laughs> also, I think I'm if you hilarious. if you Leather need help on the off. farm, if you need help on the farm, I can do cheap manual labor, I and mean, by Karen cheap I mean Lucy free. Are all, already planning a road trip, so you better yeah. get in on this. But Lucy's um, not going to do. Lucy or Karen aren't going to do any heavy lifting of any <laughs> manual labor. So if you need like holes dug or like the chicken fence up, I'm happy to do that for you for coming onto the show. 
Okay. And um, I'm coming too because I'm just gonna yeah. invite myself. You're Why invited. not? <laughs> oh, yes. you are. Okay. I thought I, I felt sisterhood here, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> just wanna it's there. It's plug there. it in. Plug it in. Uh, no, this is awesome. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. I really Very appreciate much. it. And if you guys need anything else, just let me know. Of course. Well, Actually, we need a third host. No, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, I'll email you in the next coming weeks uh, with like marketing materials that we'll have for the episode if you want to share it on your own Twitter space and other social medias or just yell it in the streets of New York. Of course. On Twitter, um, I'm a loser, but on Instagram, no, I am No, followers. stop it. Okay, That's... perfect. Um, okay. But we should be planning this, like, season three would be released in mid to early, late June. So Exciting. you got some time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'll keep in touch. I really appreciate this. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Of course. Go Q's. Basketball, (laughs) even though you hate it. Basketball here, right here. Volleyball. I know. I love how I know that you guys do basketball. And I love how I started talking. I was like, I hate basketball. Yeah, Yeah, I hate it so much. I was like, uh, she's just kidding, um, everyone. But yeah, no. I'm going to go back to, so I'm not in the Hall of Fame. I played uh, women's basketball. Okay, maybe we should talk another time. We'll talk another time. Um, (laughs) Email me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will. I will. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay right. you guys. Ciao. Thank you so much. Bye, 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 bye Jennifer. Bye. 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 Uh, oh, that was awesome. I was so rusty. Oh my god. So okay. back in the swing of things now. Yeah. It, it actually, you know what? We, we weren't that. I didn't think the intro was rusty at all. I thought the intro was sort of like very really? smooth very oh, awesome easy. cool yeah i feel like my questions i was like uh blah, 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 blah. but she was like that's a great question i was like yes it is yeah, yeah, yes, yes it, it is, is. All i'm right. gonna beat myself now kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> i'm done talking for the rest of okay <laughs> you guys i have uh three minutes with you so um yep, let's first of all, great that, job that everyone conclusion uh recorded and then we can get you oh, out yeah. of here yeah you guys okay uh <laughs> whenever you two are ready in five four three And that's it for today's episode. Thank you all for listening and joining us on this journey. Emmett is over already there sweating. Oh oh my God, sweating profusely. (laughs) Profusely. If you like what you've heard, we encourage you to like and subscribe. We've got many more conversations and stories to share in the coming weeks. Share with a friend and leave a review. We'll read them. We will. We will. Oh, we, will. Um, we will. I need that. But... I need good reviews. <laughs> Only good reviews. I'm going to turn over to Emmett. Emmett, how did you feel? Oh, you were Jennifer fantastic, Murphy is just, way. she is uh, like, a I hate to light? use the word. Yeah, she is a beaming light. She's such an unsung, humble hero. She's yes. done so much for her and community, for women. And she's gorgeous. She's 46. She's single. So she's 40. anybody, anybody, yeah, no, 46 <laughs> is crazy. Also, she looks like 27. Um, she does. She does. But just shouts out, and that's such an understatement, but shouts out to all first responders, nurses, Absolutely. healthcare workers. It, it really is. They are so, they just do so much work for no credit. And just Absolutely. to have her on here and shout out other people the whole time, not herself, yeah. was just like clear testament to the type of people that we have in yeah. those positions. Spaces, yeah. Um, hey, also, you can learn more. Did you know this about Peace Players? I did not know, but tell us. Yeah, you can visit our website and following us on social media, mostly at Peace Players International, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Also, you can follow our page, the Play It Forward podcast on Instagram as well. LinkedIn, YouTube, MySpace, SoundCloud. No, SoundCloud's not even, (laughs) don't even. I I have some songs from high school, but don't look those up, please, whatever you do. You don't even want to know what I was listening to. Yep. Other plugs. If... You liked this episode. We highly, highly recommend that you get a memoir of life, death, and love on New York City's front lines. First responder by Jennifer Murphy. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, any bookstore. It is a yeah, phenomenal, yeah. phenomenal memoir. And I guarantee you, you will cry at the end. And that's good. Everyone <laughs> needs to cry. You need to cry. It's important. Jenny, I'm going to go cry and lay down. I, uh, I thought so. It. I, need I thought it to so. Start my yeah. day. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. Cry unbelievable. with joy. Joy. Though. Joy. Though.